Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. We also say hello to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial of Sermon service. And I would also like to welcome our special guests, or should I say, our special friends who are here to worship with us on this historic occasion. Today we gather to give thanks to God for our new monarch, King Charles, and for Queen Camilla. This special occasion is that it's right and proper that we celebrate it and ask God's blessing on them as they take on the role representing this country as our head of state. Just before we begin, can I also thank the congregation once again for that extremely generous gift you gave me on my birthday. Helen and I used it to pay for an excursion to visit the Vatican, the Sistine Chapel and St. Peter's Basilica during our recent holiday. Without it, we would have had to queue for over four hours to get in. We didn't. But I can also just say that having visited these incredible places, I'd still rather conduct worship here in the Old Kirk. <laughs> just a reminder to the session, um, unfortunately we're going to have to cancel the uh, safeguarding training on Thursday. Um, I'll get back to you with an alternative date. We're going to sit quietly just for a moment as we remember the people in Ukraine. Thank you. Let us worship God as we sing our opening hymn, Judge Eternal. Almighty God, on this day when we give thanks for the life and service of our King Charles and his Queen Camilla, we remember that you are the maker of kings. You are the one who gives a monarch true power to rule, and only if they follow your lead can they exercise that power effectively and fairly. We remember that as King of kings and Lord of lords, you never forget to put your children first. You were always prepared to do what was required, even sacrificing your own son so that we might be freed from the power of sin and evil. As we celebrate the coronation of King Charles, remind us that we need to continue to celebrate 
all that you have done for us, yesterday, today, and forever. Remind us that monarchs and their subjects are not perfect, and that we all have a need to reflect on the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone, which have adversely affected others, for which we need forgiveness. Remind us that each day we ought to come before the cross of Christ and to ask for your mercy, that our sins might be wiped away, our hearts cleansed once more, and our spirits renewed and reinvigorated for your service. Today we celebrate not only the coronation, but the goodness and generosity of our heavenly King and loving Father. And here is now as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm now going to invite Anne Maxwell to read the first of our lessons. The first reading is taken from Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. (coughs) I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Amen. Thank you, Anne. We sing again. Brother, sister, let me serve you.
Our second reading should have been by Kate Lockhart, but sadly Kate is under the weather, so Sandra is going to read for us. second reading is from Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1 to verse 11. The Temptation of Jesus. When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil, after fasting for forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came unto him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. All this I will give you, he said, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. God bless to us this reading from his holy word and to his name be praise and glory. Thank you, Sandra. We sing again, Lord of all hopefulness. <laughs> of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our reading. Amen. I'm sure some of you may notice that the content of this sermon is going to be um, has similar overtones to what the Archbishop of Canterbury said yesterday. 
I just want you to know I wrote this sermon four weeks ago before I went on holiday. <laughs> so if there's any plagiarism, it's on his part. Or maybe it's just great minds think alike. And if anyone finishes that quote, there's the door. <laughs> For the past 70 years, we have lived through the second Elizabethan age. And now we are here right at the very beginning of the third Carolinian age. I have to say that I hope that the third Carolinian age is a little bit better than the first two. Because both reigns were times of extreme unrest in this country leading to civil and religious wars in the United Kingdom. When Charles I ascended the throne in 1625, he decided to make the mainstay of his monarchy the imposition of a doctrine that his father had toyed with, but which he had had the brains not to push too far forward with. I am, of course, referring to the doctrine of the divine right of kings. And this doctrine stated that as kings were called and ordained by God, that they were then beyond any influence or authority of any earthly power, either church or state. Charles I pursued this policy for almost a quarter of a century, fighting with Parliament and the church until the country descended into civil war, which only ended with his execution at Whitehall in 1649. The first Carolinian age wasn't a highlight in our nation's history. Six days later, the second Carolinian age began when the Scottish Parliament proclaimed his son Charles II but refused him entry to Scotland unless he swore to uphold the national covenant and the Presbyterian system of church government. Needless to say, he refused to do so. And that led to what is known as the Interregnum, a period when the United Kingdom was effectively a republic with a head of state rather than a monarch. It also led to Oliver Cromwell invading Scotland and taking over the original church of St John here in Ayr as a stables and building this church, this building, in 1654. So Charles II wasn't all that bad. At least until he, restored, he was restored to the throne in 1660. Because a year later, he rejected his oath to preserve the national covenant and the Presbyterian form of worship. And then he too fell foul of the plague known as the divine right of kings. And he tried to impose the Anglican style of worship on Presbyterian Scotland. And what became known as the killing times began. Thousands died as the king tried to convert the Presbyterians to Anglicanism. We have martyrs in a grave just outside the walls of this church, as does Fenny, which suffered the greatest number of martyrs of any parish in Scotland. And the killings only ended when Charles died in 1688. So the second Carolinian age wasn't much better than the first. So what about Charles III? Is it third time lucky? Are we any more optimistic about the third Carolinian age? Personally, I am more optimistic, because if you leave aside all the media hype and speculation and simply look at the man, then I think you will find a good, honest, humble human being who, like his mother before him, has promised to be a servant of the people. On the two occasions that I have had the privilege of meeting with him <laughs> and having talked to him, I found him to be a caring and compassionate human being, and fortunately for me, someone with a sense of humour. On the first occasion I met him, I was showing HRH round the bus that we had transformed into a medical facility to be sent to Kosovo. And he commented on the amount of work that had been done and still needed to be completed. Me being me, then offered him a job. He very graciously replied that his diary was rather full and that he didn't think he would be able to assist. The second occasion was when the yeomanry were awarded the freedom of the borough. And Prince Charles, as he was then, was the, uh, the honorary colonel of the regiment. And I had the honour of welcoming him at the front door of the church and asking him to sign our visitor's book. Picture the scene. Everyone else is inside the church and the prince walks through the lich gate with me waiting at the door. We shake hands and I welcome him to the old kirk. I then tell him that I have a confession to make. And I tell the future king 
that the old Kirk of Ayr is around 20% Republican. After a brief, brief silence, he gives me a quizzical look. And I then explain about Oliver Cromwell and the old church. And he smiled and began to ask me questions about the church and about the gift that Cromwell gave to the town to build this church. He seemed to be genuinely interested in everyone he met that day. And he topped it off when he photobombed the wedding picture of a young couple who were getting married at the town hall. They were coming out as he was going in. And he spoke to them and then asked if they wanted a picture with him. I believe that Charles III is very much like his mother. And if he is half the monarch she was, we will be very fortunate indeed. And one of the rocks that has underpinned Queen Elizabeth's reign was her faith. Something that is central to King Charles as well. But I'm also see, pleased to see that he has entitled himself as defender of faith. He wants to uphold the faith of all religions and none. And that's a plus as far as I'm concerned. Of course he can't go far wrong if he remembers the example of Jesus after his coronation in the River Jordan. Jesus was then taken out into the wilderness and tested to see if he was ready for the task at hand. His first temptation was to see if he would use his newfound status and power for selfish gain by turning the stones into bread. Is there anything wrong with gaining financially from power? Yes, because that is not what power is given for. It was given to Jesus to serve others, not to accumulate wealth. Jesus taught us that power is given in order that the powerless might be helped. And from what I've seen, King Charles has in the past used his position to help others rather than to line his own pockets. The work that the Prince's Trust has done to train young people at Dumfries House, not far from here, is just one example of that. The second temptation was to see if Jesus would use his power to influence people with miracles and signs. Is there anything wrong with becoming famous because of the power to produce signs and miracles? Yes. Because then the message that Jesus came to preach would have been masked and hidden. The way Prince Charles kept to the background while his mother was alive shows that he knows the importance of humility. And the third temptation was to see if Jesus would compromise his power and take the easy road. Is there anything wrong with finding an easier route to your goal? Yes, if it means watering down the gospel that Jesus came to teach. That there is only one God worth worshipping. With all the family troubles that the king has had to deal with in the run-up to his coronation, he has never tried to avoid problems or to let them get in the way of what truly matters. He understands what it means to do your duty. Jesus used his power to overcome these temptations and throughout his life he used his power to help others regardless of the cost to himself. He healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath, not to impress the synagogue goers, but to relieve the pain and the suffering of another human being. And what did he gain? Nothing, other than that the authorities began to plan his death. On the night of his betrayal, he could easily have avoided capture, but he knew that if he did not die, then his friends would have to continue to suffer under the power of sin. <coughs> Jesus put his power aside and allowed himself to be arrested, tried and crucified. Because he knew that that was the only way to save others. His power could have saved him. But he wanted to save others. In Jesus, we see clearly how we ought to use whatever power we have. We ought to use it, no matter how limited it might be, in selfless ways. And not for personal gain. It means we must use it to shed light on the message we are called to proclaim. Not to hide it or to wrap it up in fancy paper. It means that we must use it to avoid compromising our faith. To trust Jesus regardless of the cost to us. 
It means that we have to be ready to sacrifice our power if that allows us to help others. Real power is only truly effective when it is used according to God's will and in God's way. And if King Charles takes heed of that message and that example, then I believe that this nation of ours will remember the third Carolinian age in a much more positive way than it does the first two. God save the king. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. <coughs> are sent from heaven above. Father, you have sent us so many wonderful gifts, too many for us to remember, so many that we often forget. But today we are grateful and we bring this our offering before you, asking that you would accept it, bless it and use it, that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In our prayers for other people, in between each of the sections, I'm going to read the words of the hymn for the healing of the nations. Let us pray. Eternal and almighty God, we humbly bow before you, knowing that you are the sovereign Lord and master of all. Today we remember that Christ is for us the way and the truth and the life, and through him we come to you. In that knowledge, we pray for the nations of our world and all that unites and divides us. We remember the times we get it so wrong and enter into conflict, recalling the destruction that war brings. We know that this is not your way, for your way is the way of peace. We pray for peace among the nations and a recognition of each other through a common humanity and with unconditional love, a lasting peace that sees truth and life at its heart. We pray for all who work for peace, and reconciliation. For the healing of the nations, Lord, we pray with one accord, for a just and equal sharing of the things that earth affords, to a life of love and action, help us rise and pledge our word. Eternal God, you tell us that we can ask for anything in your name and you will do it. We are bold to imagine in your presence countries and nations striving for understanding and finding ways of living together. Inspired by you, may we provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Inspired by your truth, may we seek justice and bring integri integrity to public life. Inspired by your life, may we reveal the light of God's presence to the sick, the weak, and the dying, to comfort and strengthen them. Lead us forward into freedom. From despair your world release. That redeemed from war and hatred. All may come and go in peace. Show us how through care and goodness. Fear will die and hope increase. We pray for our king. The queen and the royal family. May your blessing be upon them in the duties that they carry out throughout our land and abroad. 
grant to His Majesty King Charles the gift of wise leadership and opportunities to influence the protection of our planet. Grant him clarity of vision and strength to be self-giving and faithful. May he rule with courage and faith. All that kills abundant living, let it from the earth be banned. Pride of status, race or schooling, dogmas that obscure your plan. In our common quest for justice, may we hallow brief life span. Everlasting God, before you the generations rise and pass away, and all is seen and nothing is lost. Your word has always been there since the beginning of time. The constant sound of the divine echoing in the beauty of creation. There is a truth to be discovered and rediscovered by each passing generation. In the days of this new reign, may your grace be felt once more and your praise be sung anew. May your people return and share your love with joy and hope. You, Creator God, have written your great name on humankind. For our growing in your likeness, bring the life of Christ to mind. That by our response and service, earth its destiny may find. Eternal and almighty God, hear then these our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, can I first of all thank... Stuart for uh, playing the organ this morning. Stuart, it's wonderful to have you back with us and thank you for your playing. Also to Eleanor, who stepped in 30 seconds before the service started to do the slides, having never done them before. So well done, Eleanor. Thank you. That was excellent. And also just to remind you that there'll be tea and coffee in the hall after the service. Please come and join us. We close by singing, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
the grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.